Hello, hello, and welcome back to another installment of Trade the Explainer. And I know I said the next video would probably be a cryptid one, but I'm kind of pressed for time right now, so I thought I'd like to try to make a short-ish video on something I found pretty interesting, and in doing so, this will be the first of my human evolution and diversity videos. The diversity of humanity throughout the world is something I've always found very interesting. Although we share a fairly recent common ancestor and we are all Homo sapiens sapiens, we have nonetheless developed into very unique populations with very different physical appearances as a result of many factors, such as natural selection to our corresponding environments. And today, I'd like to examine one of these unique populations that most people haven't even heard of, and talk about their pretty mysterious origins as well as their relationship with other human groups. Now, I want you to look at this picture of this man, and guess where you think he came from. Well, if you guessed European or Middle Eastern or North African or anything like that, you might be surprised to learn that this man is in fact Japanese. This man belongs to the Ainu tribe of Japan, and as you might have noticed, he and his people tend to not fit into our normal classifications of Japanese or even Asian, taking a very, almost European-looking appearance. Full-blooded Ainu people tend to be lighter skinned, hairier, sporting long beards and hair, and have different eye and facial shape compared to other inhabitants of East Asia. They appear to be very distinct from their neighbors and seem to stand against our traditional classifications of race. And this is no mistake, as the Ainu were a conundrum for anthropologists for centuries. A book written in the 1940s, so get ready for some somewhat outdated racial classifications, describes the Ainu in great detail. Many have wavy hair. Their skins are generally reported to be light brown. Old people are often found to be as white as a western man. The Ainu have broad faces and large sunken eyes, which are generally horizontal and of the so-called European type. Eyes of the Mongolian type are hardly found among them. Due to this unique appearance, it was largely believed that the Ainu belonged to a branch of Europeans that were displaced, but this again couldn't be further from the actual truth. So, who are these people exactly, and where did they come from? Well, the answer to that question is a long and complex one, and tells the tale of an ancient and almost forgotten lineage. Firstly, I should explain who the Ainu people are. Today, the Ainu are a very small ethnic group that inhabits mostly the northern islands in the Japanese archipelago, specifically Hokkaido, as well as some territories claimed by Russia nearby. Officially, their population is currently in the 20,000s, but odds are this is an underestimate, and there are perhaps hundreds of thousands of people completely unaware of their Ainu heritage walking around in Japan today. The Ainu possess their own culture that is quite different than what we would consider traditional Japanese culture. The men never shave their beards after a certain age and sport flowing beards and mustaches. Ainu women tattoo their mouths and arms, and wear garments covered in geometric designs and patterns. The legends of the Ainu claim that they were always the original inhabitants of the islands. The Ainu lived in this place a hundred thousand years before the children of the sun came. Furthermore, the Ainu are not the only unique inhabitants of Japan. Chinese records during the 400 CE mention the Mishi. I know, my pronunciation probably throughout this entire episode is going to be completely awful. Or, the hairy people living in northeastern Japan, in the uncivilized lands. They were noted as having a strange physical appearance, and are often described as having long beards and many of the other same characteristics used to describe the Ainu of today. Some of the Amishi tribes are said to have resisted the early Japanese emperors during the Middle Ages, often using guerrilla tactics. These Amishi are largely, if not entirely, extinct, and only survive in historical records. Archaeological evidence also illustrates an ancient culture of hunter-gatherers existed in Japan in Earth's prehistory. From 14,000 BCE to 300 BCE, what is called the Jomon culture dominated Japan. These people created distinctive pottery and figurines. They appear to be culturally similar to both the Amishi and the Ainu, and were likely physically similar as well. Genetic evidence taken from Jomon skeletons shows a close relationship between the Jomon and today's Ainu. The relationships between the Ainu, Amishi, and the Jomon culture isn't exactly clear, as it is difficult to reconstruct their histories after such a long time, but it is clear that they were all close relatives of one another, and the Ainu and Amishi at the very least descended from the people of the Jomon culture. The ethnic Japanese people of today, the Yamato Japanese, are largely a mixture of the Jomon culture and the Yaoi culture. The Yaoi culture came from the mainland Asia, likely originating from modern-day Korea, and it is likely they are the children of the sun Ainu legends refer to. The agricultural Yaoi, who likely resembled what we would consider modern Asians, invaded and began colonizing Japan during the Iron Age, 300 BCE, and absorbed and overran the native population of the Jomon peoples, resulting in our modern Japanese. This is proven by genetic evidence that shows that most Japanese today have around 20% Jomon ancestry. However, not all the descendants of the Jomon intermix equally or 
entirely. It appears the ancestors of the Ainu and the Amishi in northern Japan resisted this intermingling more than their southern relatives, and thus largely isolated themselves culturally and genetically, and in doing so, retained many of the traits and characteristics of the Jomon. It appears in Ainu populations, intermixing between Yaoi and other East Asian peoples did occur, but probably not as great to an extent as other populations in Japan. This explains why modern Ainu populations don't exactly look alike, some of more Jomon-blooded ancestry than others. As you can start to see with all this evidence, it is becoming clear who the Ainu people are. They are in part the descendants of the original inhabitants of Japan, essentially Japan's Native Americans or Aboriginals. The Jomon ancestors of the Ainu arrived in Japan probably during the Ice Age by crossing a now destroyed land bridge connecting Japan to the rest of Asia. Thousands of years later, the ancestors of modern Asians also arrived in Japan and began colonizing the regions themselves. They encountered these pre-existing Japanese and intermixed with them, largely watering down the unique appearance and culture of these people, and creating what we would consider the Japanese of today. Only the Ainu and other cultures which isolated themselves remain as a remnant of these ancient native Japanese people. Although most people outside of Japan have never heard of them, these ancient aboriginal Japanese have had a large impact on Japanese culture even today. Specifically, Japanese manga and anime appear to have characters and cultures largely influenced if not partly influenced by the Ainu, Amishi, and Jomon. The Amishi serve as the primary inspiration for the anime Princess Mononoke, and the story depicts the last remnants of the Amishi during the expansion of the Yamato Empire in the Middle Ages. Additionally, I think a case can be made for them being the partial influence to both the Ishvalan and Fullmetal Alchemist, and Krapka and his tribe, the almost extinct Kurtka clan in Hunter x Hunter, judging from his style of clothing and other similarities. And it's a shame that the funny History of Japan video basically glazed over this period in Japanese history, as I find it very interesting. But still, none of this explains why they appear so different physically and genetically from other Asian groups. Well, in order to understand this, we need to talk about haplogroups. Haplogroups, and I am simplifying here, are a collection of genes that are typically inherited together from a single parent. This is called a haploid type. A certain combination of these inherited genes and alleles will only appear in people who are descendants from this specific single parent. This allows geneticists to track the line of descent of a person and figure out their relationship to other people. For instance, because the Y chromosome is only passed from a father to a son, we can use a combination of certain genes which will remain virtually the same when passed from father to son on the Y chromosome to determine the patrilineal line of a person. The son of his son and his son's son should all have a similar combination of genes regardless of who the mother is. Additionally, we can find out if your great-great-great etc. grandfather also fathered other sons, as well as your own family line. The sons of his son should have a similar, if not identical, haploid type to you, and this allows us to see if you two are in fact related. A similar thing can be done using the mitochondrial DNA of one's mother to determine the matrilineal line of a person. Haplogroups, because of this, are incredibly useful in determining human ancestry, and is often the primary tool used for ancestry websites like 23andMe and Ancestry.com. Haplogroups can be used to determine the ancestry of thousands if not millions of people, and can go back thousands of years and countless generations. Typically in human evolution, they are labeled in broad categories by using letters A, B, C, etc. Mutations picked up over time can create subgroupings of a line within a line. In short, this method allows us to create a family tree of all of humanity and all of life if you want to go that far. Now, human Y chromosome DNA haplogroupings are especially significant when you're trying to figure out the ancestry of the Ainu and Jomon in the relation to other peoples. When the Y chromosome data of these people were tested, no relation to European populations was found, and little relation to even other Asian populations was found as well. It was discovered that members of the Ainu population mainly belong to the Y haploid group D. This Y haploid group is found in many people in the Japanese archipelago, but occur most frequently in Ainu populations to the north. This is interesting to say the least, as basically all other East Asians belong to the Y haploid group C, O, or N. The only other places in the world where Y haplogroup D is found outside of Japan is in Tibet and Burma, and in very light frequencies scattered throughout Central Asia. And, most intriguing of all, in extremely high frequencies in the Andamanese, native inhabitants of the Andaman Islands. The Andaman Islands is a very isolated island chain that sits in the Bay of Bengal. The indigenous people of these islands have had very little contact with other cultures for thousands of years, and it is believed that they have been isolated from the mainland for at least 20,000 years. Among them is the Sentinelese, which are just one of probably around a hundred uncontacted peoples around the globe. These people have had basically no contact with the outside world, and essentially still live a hunter-gatherer lifestyle essentially unchanged since the Ice Age, completely unaware of the world that exists off their island. What's bizarre is when you look at the physical appearance of these people and compare them with the Ainu, 
The two share basically no physical resemblance, despite being the closest living relatives to one another in their patrilineal line. In this respect, Y haploid group D is very mysterious and strange. Unlike the other groupings, the geographic distributions of the group are very distinct and widely dispersed. It is a high frequency on the Andaman Islands, but curiously has no frequency whatsoever in coastal areas surrounding the islands. It is found in Japan in high frequencies, but can't really be found elsewhere close nearby. Furthermore, it is interesting to learn that Y haploid D group's closest relatives are again not Asian or Indian, but are in fact members of Y haploid group E, which is found almost exclusively in Africa. So, these members of Y haploid group D are also closest related to native Africans as well, meaning Europeans and East Asians are closer related to each other than they are to them. Literally, what the heck is going on here? Well, the exact dispersal or formation of these peoples is unclear, and probably will remain so. You must remember all this occurred before men could even write, and much intermixing between different peoples has occurred since then, so it is difficult to reconstruct. But one thing is clear, Y haploid group D was a branch of humans that left Africa and broke off from the other human groups very early on, as far back as 50 to 60,000 years ago. While the ancestors of both Europeans and modern Asians were still in Africa, they had already left for greener places. The migration of humans out of Africa and into Asia was not a single event by a single group of people, but one of several independent migrations of several groups out of Africa. Among the first of these migrations to leave Africa were the haploid group Ds, judging from the dark skin of the Andamanese and to the lesser extent tibeto burman people, as well as their close relationship to native Africans, we can infer that what I will refer to as the Ds were very dark skinned people who migrated and dispersed into Asia 60,000 years ago, probably taking a southern route. These Paleolithic Black Asians were the original Original human inhabitants of Asia. They inhabited both the mainland and various islands along the coast. Among these black Asians were a branch that traveled to the Andaman Islands, and they became the Andamanese. Another branch traveled to Japan and became the Joman culture, and it appears the light pale skin possessed by the Joman, Amishi, and Ainu was a secondary evolution to absorb more ultraviolet light in higher latitude regions, possibly and interestingly made independently from both Asians and Europeans. Others traveled to Tibet and Central Asia and became the ancestors of those members of D in those regions today. But if they were once so widely spread, what happened to these haploid D people and why are they so rare nowadays? Well, we don't know exactly. It appears that in some isolated areas, like on islands, they continued to exist and survive until recent times, and on the mainland, they were incorporated and intermixed with other human groups to a degree. But they contribute relatively little to today's gene pool, and it appears that they largely disappeared from the Earth entirely. One of the leading theories is that on the mainland, some kind of catastrophe in prehistory caused these people simply to die out from who knows what, disease or scarcity, or maybe something more sinister. It is possible these people were the victims victims of a prehistoric genocide of sorts, murdered by other human groups and then replaced, but who knows? All we know is that the populations on islands were spared whatever this fate was, and Asia eventually became populated by other human groups. The East Asians we see today probably weren't the original inhabitants of the region, but the true original inhabitants were these lost humans belonging to Y haploid group D. The members of haploid group D we see today are relics, the legacy of a now largely extinct black Asians who called this region home before anyone else. Hey guys, this is a post-recording edit, so after looking back, I'd like to make a minor correction. There's a lot of debate on this subject, and it's a bit gray at the moment. D may or may not have been the first group to enter Asia. There's a lot of scientists that do support D being the first, but there's also others that support C being the first. Why haploid group C, the group that largely includes Australian Aboriginals and Pacific Islanders and has very faint traces in the rest of Asia, is also said to have migrated into Asia around the same time or maybe even slightly before D, give or take a few thousand years. Either way, both groups preceded O, which most East Asians nowadays belong to. Nonetheless, D would have been among Asia's first, if not the first, human inhabitants. As a side note, C's modern distribution is similarly gap-like in East Asia compared to D, and this suggests a similar dying off of some kind happened to them as well. It appears several independent waves of humans migrated out of Africa and into Asia. Group D was among the first to migrate into Asia, and did so entirely independent from other Asian groups like C or F. And the reason why the Jomon, Ainu, and Amishi people don't really meet any of our modern racial classifications, such as having completely different eye shapes, facial structure, and so on, compared to people in Asia, is because they took an entirely independent evolutionary path from anybody else. So, who is this man and where does he come from? 
Well, he is the descendant of an ancient branch of early humanity. His ancestors broke off from the others very early on. They left Africa probably before anyone else. They ended up in Japan, and his ancestors mixed somewhat with the other newer Asians who had replaced his kin on the mainland. Over the centuries, his people isolated themselves and retained their ancestral traits, and, well, here we are today. Almost all of this history was left completely unrecorded by humanity. It was mainly genetic evidence that was the only way we have been able to at least glimpse these events that occurred in our distant past. I know this is sounding like uh, some We Was Kangs conspiracy stuff, but this is all true and supported by the evidence. For the longest time, human populations were classified as incredibly distinct and clear-cut, but we now know it's a lot bigger. The case of the Ainu people shows us that humans and all living things for that matter have a very complex ancestry, and all of us have just as weird and intricate evolutionary histories from which we got our genes. It is fascinating to think what else is hidden in humanity's prehistory. What other branches and peoples existed back then, with their stories no longer visible in our modern world? And on that almost anticlimactic note, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something new because I certainly did. Tell me what you thought about this evolution discussing us humans. I find human evolution and human diversity fascinating, and I'd hope to talk more about it in the future. So tell me if you enjoyed it or not. Alright? See you guys, and... I'll, I'll hopefully see you next time. Maybe later this month. It'll help. All depends. You know, just life getting in the way. Alright, see ya.